Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 19th of July. And for those CrowdStrike users, I hope uh, you get everything sorted out and you have a better day as it goes on. As always, I have the chapters, so you can jump to any particular update you care about the most. New videos this week, it was very Entra themed. So I dived into the new Entra PowerShell module. It's still using the Microsoft Graph endpoint, but it's a lot more user scenario, user friendly, instead of using the Microsoft Graph module, which isn't so user friendly. And then I quickly explored what is the Entra suite, what's in it, what are the prereqs uh, for that. On to what's new. So on the compute side, so Azure Container Apps, remember Azure Container Apps provides a serverless platform because it can scale to zero that abstracts things like AKS, but it adds Dapper for all those great microservice capabilities, Kada for the scaling as network capabilities, and it lets me host my container-based applications, my microservices. So now it has Key Vault certificate support. So now for my TLS certificates that I'm using at an environmental level, I can leverage those certificates that are stored in Azure Key Vault. The benefit here is that I could leverage things like managed identities to go and interact with the Key Vault, so I'm not having to worry about secrets, but also I can leverage features of Azure Key Vault around auto-rotation, for example, for those certificates. Azure Container Apps also now has peer-to-peer -peer encryption. So it's gonna use TLS between the different applications and all of the network traffic within that specific environment. Remember an environment contains one or more container apps or jobs. It's gonna use a privately managed certificate for everything within that particular environment scope. Now, it is using TLS encryption, so there obviously is some overhead in terms of CPU. So it may introduce some additional latency, it may reduce the maximum throughput you see. So you definitely wanna go and do some testing to make sure it's not negatively impacting the performance you require for your applications before you go and turn this on in production. So it's not enabled by default. You need to go and turn this on. Also now we have managed identity support for scaling rules. So if we think about we may scale with Kada, we have some fantastic flexibility in how we scale the instances we have of our applications. And maybe I wanna scale based on things like um, queue storage, maybe it's based on event hub, maybe service bus. And in the past, what I would have to do in my scaling rule is have some secret to let me go and communicate with those services to work out, do I need to scale? Well, now I can use managed identity. So I can use the managed identity within my Azure Container app to perform the authentication to those target services that I'm using as part of my scaling rules. So again, it helps remove the storage of the secret. It improves my all up security. Azure Functions now has Redis uh, extension. So I can use it for triggering. So the triggering could be really useful for, hey, I have something happen on Redis that I want to trigger that serverless capability, run something in an Azure function. There are certain uh, architectures like a right behind cache scenario or just event-based architectures where when something happens in my Redis cache, I need to go and perform some action, maybe on some backend actual data store. So I can now do this with this. I can also use it for input and output bindings. So an input would be, I wanna retrieve some data from the Redis cache. An output would be, hey, I wanna go and change some key in the cache. So all of those are now available with my Azure function. And also, it now has .NET 8 support for the in-process model. Now remember, the in-process model is where my function's code is running in the same process as the function's host process. This is different from what we have with the isolated worker. In the isolated worker, my function code runs in a completely separate .NET worker process. So I could have a different version of .NET from that of the function host. Well now, because .NET 6, is I think it's 12th of November of this year, 2024, it's ending support. Now the in process is moving to .NET 8 support as well. So start looking at your code. Either you can go and update the in process to .NET 8, 
or you could use the isolated worker model, but you need to go and start using .NET 8. And then for my Gen 1, remember this is the old BIOS based or the Gen 2, which is UEFI based virtual machine scale sets. Now this is only the uniform mode, not the new flexible mode, but for that uniform mode, if I have my Gen 1 or Gen 2, I can now upgrade to the Gen 2 trusted launch. Now what Trusted Launch does is it takes advantage of that virtual TPM we get with the UEFI based virtual machines and then it can have things like Secure Boot. So I get an attestation from the hardware startup, the virtual hardware, all the way through to the operating system. That helps give me protection from boot kits, root kits, I get other enhanced security. And so now what I can actually do is perform that upgrade of my resources to start taking advantage of that. On the networking side, I'm pretty positive we've covered this before, but Azure Virtual Network Manager, remember that gives me this central management of my virtual networks, even across many, many different subscriptions. It has connectivity, it has security, and even routing capabilities. Well, the Mesh and Direct Connect have gone GA. So what these do is, remember, we create these groups of networks, and I have now a connected group gets created with Mesh. It's Every virtual network can directly talk to every virtual network. Direct Connect layers on top of a hub and spoke model. So the hub maybe has that connectivity for Express Route or a site to site VPN. But when I enable Direct Connect on that hub and spoke model, it also enables the spokes within that connected group to also directly connect to each other and they don't have to hop via the hub. So I'll get that reduced latency. And these don't use peering is using an, an internal mechanism to facilitate those communications. So that is now generally available. Express Route FastPath now has peering and UDR support. Now remember FastPath is ordinarily when traffic comes into a virtual network from my circuit, the traffic goes via that gateway we deploy within the virtual network. So that gateway introduces a certain amount of latency and throttles potentially the throughput that I can achieve. Egress traffic never goes through the gateway. Egress traffic from your VNet always goes directly to the Microsoft Enterprise Edge routers at whatever your peering location is. FastPath for that inbound traffic to your VNet doesn't go through the gateway. So now suddenly I reduce some of that latency, but I can have the maximum throughput, maybe 100 gigabits per second. Well now, I also can get that fast path to resources in a peered virtual network, and it will still respect those user-defined routes. So now I could get that 100 gigabits per second flowing through to resources in a peered virtual network. So it just expands uh, my use case scenarios. And Express Route Traffic Collector is now available for provider circuits. So Traffic Collector is that fully managed monitoring solution built for Express Route. It lets me collect the IP FIX flow records that give me detail into all of the traffic flows across my Express Route circuit to give me visibility into what's happening. And this was available before if I had Express Route Direct. Now Express Route Direct, I own both those ports. You always get a pair of ports. Uh, for the active, active, the resiliency. Well, now it's provided just for provider circuits as well. I think it's one gigabit per second and above, but I can now turn this on and help get that visibility. On the storage side, so Azure Databox now has cross-region transfer capabilities. Remember, Azure Databox is where you get this unit delivered to your location. I can copy a bunch of data on it and I ship it back. So this is in the real physical world. I ship it via a carrier to the closest Azure data center who then ingests that into some storage service. So it's really useful when I just have a massive amount of data I want to get into Azure and I can go the other way as well that maybe it's not practical based on the speed of my actual network connectivity. What this enables me to do is let's say I now want to be able to ingest it into a storage service that's not within my country or my local region there's now specific sets of locales that now will allow me to, I still ship it to within my particular country, but it can actually be ingested over Microsoft's network without any data charges into something else. Now it does vary depending on if it's data box, data box heavy or data box disk, but here I'm looking at data box, the regular, and you can see here that, hey, I could ship it 
for example, to Singapore, and I could actually read it into a storage account in a US region, for example. And you can see there's other combinations here. So that, that might be really useful when I do have those needs to get it into other regions. The physical data box itself is not traveling across those geographies. It's still going to a data center close to you. And then it's using the Azure Backbone Network. On the database side, Kusto's update command has now gone GA. Normally when I think of Kusto, what we're really focusing on is appending data. Well, then they introduced a delete command. And now what happens with the update command in a single command from me, it does the delete and then an append. So it lets me change a particular record by effectively deleting the old one and creating a new one with the new value. So that will make it easier for many of my ingestion scenarios that I can now just perform that single update command. Cosmos DB's Data Explorer now has a multi-select delete. And um, if we actually jump over super quickly, this one's an easy one to demo. So I'm in a Cosmos DB account. You can see I have my Data Explorer. I go and look at the items for something. Hey, I can go and select a bunch of them and then I could go and hit delete, which I'm not gonna do because I want my data, but it will make it simpler if I need to go and do those more bulk level uh, type delete operations. PostgreSQL has new minor versions, uh, 16.3, 15.7, 14.12, 13.15, and 12.19. This is all for flexible server. Obviously the single server is deprecated now. This is gonna happen for you automatically as part of your monthly uh, plan maintenance. And also for major versions, uh, 16 is now supported. Now what this does is an in-place upgrade. I, I trigger this, it's minimal downtime. So there is some downtime. It's gonna go and do a quick check. So it does a pre-check to make sure there's no things that would cause a failure. Then it uses the PG upgrade tool to perform the actual in-place upgrade. It would disable any HA as part of that. It, most extensions are also upgraded to the newest versions. And then the actual upgrade is offline, but typically that's about 15 minutes. So I can now do that. That saves me in the past, I had to go and create a new one and move all the data across. So the in-place upgrade is really nice. And then the PG Vector version 0 0.7 is now supported. Remember. We care about vectors hugely in this world of AI because vectors enable us to represent the semantic meaning of data as opposed to the exact, trying to do maybe a, a full text search or the exact numbers. It lets us in natural language find, hey, what is the meaning of what I'm looking for compared to the meaning of the data? As so what the PG vector does is it adds a number of uh, capabilities to create those vectors and also abilities to go and compare the vectors to find, for example, the nearest neighbor, which is the closest semantic meaning data. Um, so they've actually got some new vector capabilities, there were some new types, and also there were some new algorithms for finding those neighbors. On the miscellaneous, so Windows 365 now has passkey support for the iOS and Android clients. Remember passkeys, is based on the phishing resistant. There's a certain proximity requirement um, to ensure that I can't be tricked into doing something. It takes the human element out of the, the phishing. So now I can go and use both pass keys and also FIDO devices to do authentication for Windows 365 uh, from those platforms. And then for Azure OpenAI, there's a new default content filter. So one of the huge things we have with AI is because it's creative, it's harder to have those regular prescriptive measures. So we have content filters to maybe help detect certain types of harmful content. But also we can look for things like um, jailbreak detection. We can look for uh, protected material, this could be text or code in the generated output. So the new default V2 has those latest safety capabilities. Now it doesn't change existing content filters. This would only apply to the new resources, the new deployments you perform. And it wouldn't modify if I have a custom content filter. 
GPT-40 is available in more regions using the global standard deployment. So global standard deployment, what that says is, hey, um, it can go and route my traffic to any region based on what has the best availability with all the different data centers with that model. Now that means my latency may be a little bit variable because it can be sent to different places. It also means I don't have strict control of any data res residency. It's good for maybe experimentation, for development. If I need those stricter controls for both latency or that data residency, then I can use maybe the standard or even provisioned if I need also guaranteed latency of the actual processing and the generation of those tokens. But for those experimentations, those developments, the availability of that global standard deployments in more regions uh, just makes it more available for all of us. Also, there's a reduction in the hosting cost for those fine-tuned models. So generally, we get these foundational models that are very general sets of capabilities, and then we may want to fine-tune them. Fine-tuning is really useful maybe if we need to introduce some very industry or domain-specific terms we need or knowledge we need to maybe change the style, the way it responds that I couldn't do with just regular prompt engineering where I change um, the prompt that's given into the model. And there's a hosting charge when I have these fine-tuned models because Microsoft has to kind of keep that available so it can meet the SLAs and meet the performance. Well, there's been a huge reduction in the hosting charges of those fine-tuned models. Um, for example, GPT-3.5 Turbo, I think it's something like a 43% discount. So that's gonna make it again more attractive to use those fine-tuned models and leverage them in the environment. And of course, there was the 4.0 Mini, which is even cheaper from a token perspective. It's a smaller version. I think it's gonna replace the 3.5 Turbo for many customers um, for those more specialized types interactions. And that was it. Uh, again, as always, I hope that was useful. And, and again, if you're having a bad day, they'll be a, a light at the end of the tunnel. I uh, hope it goes okay for you and uh, take care.